the prophecy of Obadiah. Well, brethren, it's some 65 years since Israel became a nation in 1948. So today we'd like to consider what lies ahead for the nation of Israel. The book of Obadiah is only 21 verses long, but it gives us the greatest detail of the role of Christendom and what they play in Jacob's trouble more than most other prophecies. There are 13 individuals in the Old Testament that are named Obadiah, but we don't know which one wrote the book. There's nothing specifically mentioned about the author. As with much of the Old Testament, prophecies had a literal fulfillment as well as a symbolic one. And so today we're going to be considering the, the symbolic symbolism that is brought to our attention in Obadiah. Verse 1 sets the scene with Obadiah telling us of a vision that he saw from God of the judgment that would come to Edom for what they will do to Israel. But before we get into the details of Obadiah and the judgment of Edom, we want to recall who Edom symbolizes in prophecy. In volume 4, page 14, we read, Edom, it will be remembered, was the name given to Esau, the twin brother of Jacob, after he sold his birthright. The name was also subsequently applied both to the people descended from him and through the country in which they settled. Consequently, the name Edom is an appropriate symbol of a class who in this age have similarly sold their birthright, and that too for a consideration as trifling as the mess of pottage which influenced Esau. Thus, the symbolic Edom of prophecy corresponds to the symbolic Babylon of Revelation and of the prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel." Unquote. Notice the location of the land of Edom. It's south of the Dead Sea, bordering on the land of Moab. Now as we proceed, we want to note there are four distinct aspects of Edom or Christendom that are symbolically differentiated by three locations within the country of Edom. I'm going to circle the four locations. There's the country overall of Edom, there's the capital, Basra, a city called Teman, and the mountain range of Edom called Mount Seir. And so as we continue, we'll find that Edom corresponds to Christendom overall, political, religious, civil, financial, and so on. Basra is the capital of Edom. It's a picture of the religious segment of Christendom by itself. Mount Seir is a picture of the civil governments of Christendom. And Timon is a picture of the church-state union of Christendom. Isaiah 34.6 gives us the background of Basra. The sword of Jehovah is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, with the blood of lambs and goats. For Jehovah had a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Brother Russell comments on this great slaughter of lambs and goats in, in Basra in volume 4, page 17, after our previous quote. As all the land of Edom symbolizes all of Christendom, so its capital city, Basra, represented ecclesiasticism, the chief citadel of Christendom. The prophet represents the Lord as a victorious warrior who makes a great slaughter in Edom, and especially in Basra. The name Basra signifies sheepfold. Basra is even yet noted for its goats, and the slaughter of this day of vengeance is said to be of the lambs and goats. The goats would correspond to the tares 
while the lambs would represent the tribulation saints. So this quote shows a distinction between Edom, which symbolizes all of Christendom, and Basra, its capital, which represents only the religious element, ecclesiasticism. This is where the tares will be burned and from which the tribulation saints or great company will come out of when the false churches are crushed in the final winepress of trouble. So thus, the country of Edom pictures Christendom overall, Basra the capital, the religious element, and now we want to go on to see how Mount Seir symbolizes the civil governments of Christendom as separate from the church religious element. Recall that in prophecy, mountains represent governments. Thus, as we go on to consider Mount Seir in prophecy, we, we want to bear in mind it represents the civil government of Christendom as separate and distinct from Basra, which pictures the religious element by itself. In Joshua 24, 4, we're told, Mount Seir was given to Esau. I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. To see how Mount Seir pictures the civil governments of Christendom, we first want to recall the union or confederacy that's formed prior to Armageddon that we have read and studied of often in Revelation 16, 13, and 14. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils which go forth to gather the whole world to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. This church-state union, however, we know will not last. For in Revelation 18, we're told how plagues will come upon Babylon and the religious element will fall or be destroyed first, prior to the civil government's fall. 18.8, therefore shall her plagues, that is Babylon's plagues, come in one day and she will be utterly burned with fire. But then, after the false church's destruction, we have the next verse telling us that the kings of the earth, picturing Christendom civil governments, they're still on the scene after the churches have collapsed. Revelation 18.9, And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her, <coughs> when they see the smoke of her burning. Now, as we go on to consider Mount Seir in prophecy, bear this point in mind. The false churches fall first, the civil governments last. The entire 35th chapter of Ezekiel is about the destruction of symbolic Mount Seir. And we'll see how the destruction of the kings or civil governments of Christendom is going to take place in the last phase of Jacob's trouble as the armies of Christendom are destroyed on the mountains of Israel. Jehovah is speaking in Ezekiel 35, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> Behold, Mount Seir, I am against you. I will make you a desolate waste. Thus you shall know that I am the Lord. For you have maintained an immemorial feud and handed over the Israelites to the sword in the hour of their doom at the time of their final punishment. So notice here the, the setting of this scripture. The civil governments of Christendom, Mount Seir, are handed over to the, handed over the enemy, handed over the Israelites to the sword in the hour of their doom at the time of their final punishment. When I say the enemy, I should have said Mount Seir. From one standpoint, we will see that they are an enemy of Israel at that time. So the setting is Jacob's trouble, the time of their final punishment. The time that Christendom was supposed to be an ally to help protect Israel 
but instead they handed over Israel to the sword. That is, they let the armies of Gog, who attacked from the north, coming against Israel, attack them. And while Mount Seir or Christendom's armies just stood by and gloated or rejoiced over Jerusalem's destruction, as we're going to see shortly in Obadiah, where it gives us more detail. Continuing in Ezekiel, the scene progresses to after the armies of Gog from the north have greatly crippled Israel. They've taken a spoil, and then they leave for their homeland. Mount Seir, or the civil government of Christendom, is speaking in verses 10 to 13. The two nations and the two countries, that is Judah and Israel now united, shall be mine, and I'll take them as a possession, though the Lord has been there. You have said, the mountains of Israel are desolate, that is, they're desolate after Gog has ransacked Israel. So they've been left desolate now and have been given to us, to Christendom's armies, to devour. Mount Seir, or Christendom's civil government, now sees an opportunity to take a spoil after the forces of Gog have left. The mountains of Israel are desolate and have been given for us to devour. We continue now with the response of God in verse 14. These are the words of the Lord God. I will make you so desolate that the whole world will gloat or rejoice over you. He's talking about Christendom. I will do to you as you did to Israel, mine own possession, when you gloated or rejoiced over its desolation. O oh, Mount Seir, you will be desolate, and it will be the end of all Edom. Thus men will know that I am the Lord. And so here we see that the civil arm of Christendom, Mount Seir, gloats or rejoices over the desolation in Israel by the forces of Gog from the north. And therefore God says he will make Mount Seir desolate. And then it mentions it will be the end of all Edom. Why, why does it say this will be the end of, of all Edom? Well, I think it's to show us that it's the last step of a two-step phase process of the destruction of Christendom. The churches fall first, pictured by Basra, being crushed in the wine press, and then last to fall will be the civil governments when their armies are defeated and destroyed on Mount Seir. This is what will complete the two-step process of God bringing an end of all Edom symbolic of the removal or destruction of the last aspect of Christendom, the kings or civil governments. Now with this foundation of Edom symbolizing Christendom, Basra, the religious element, Mount Seir, the civil governments, we'd like to go on now to consider the book of Obadiah verse by verse. The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us go against her for battle. So the vision that God gives Obadiah here is the judgment to come against Edom or Christendom. For God has foreseen what Edom will do to Israel. And he ranges for an envoy to, envoy to go to the nations, telling them to go against Edom to battle. Verse 2, Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to earth? Though you build high like the Mount Eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. So throughout the ages, Christendom's union of church and state had a pompous rulership over the people with, with a great arrogance, saying in verse 3, who will ever bring us down to earth? 
God responds, though you set your nest among the stars, they felt they were elevated. I will bring you down, declares the Lord Jehovah. Verses 5 and 6 go on to tell us how Edom will be so thoroughly decimated there will be nothing left of Satan's false kingdom. And then verse 7 indicates what will contribute to Edom's or Christendom's fall. It's the confederacy that she had previously entered into. All the men of thy confederacy, the men that were at peace with you, have deceived you and prevailed against you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. The confederacy mentioned here that once lived in peace is the same confederacy we considered in revelation of church and state. But Obadiah here tells us that this confederacy that previously lived in peace together will turn against one another just as we read in Revelation 17, where you recall a harlot rode a beast which had ten horns. And the ten horns, we realize, pictured the civil governments of, Euro uh, of Europe who were in union with the harlot, supporting her throughout the age. But just like in Obadiah, the confederacy reverses itself as in Revelation 17:16. The ten horns which thou sawest, and the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. The confederacy will come to an abrupt end. The civil governments who previously supported the harlot throughout the age, as well as the people who supported her, will come, we're told, to hate her, and will help to bring about her destruction. Obadiah continues in showing that all the leaders of Christendom's churches and state and of this confederacy will be removed or cut down. In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, men of understanding in the mountains of Esau? Your warriors, O Teman, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. So all the wise men or church state leaders of Christendom will be removed, including this, a new symbolic name given of Teman. Notice verse 9, your warriors, the armies, O Teman, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. The warriors of Teman on Esau's mountain that will be cut down is referring to the armies of Christendom's church and state union that will be cut down in Jacob's trouble on the mountains of Israel. Well, time doesn't allow to go on to explain why the name Teman is used to refer to the armies of Christendom, but it's going to be on the handout if you, uh, that you could read if you like. Obadiah now continues in verses 10 to 14 to give us the final reason why Edom or Christendom will be cut off forever. Now, as we read these next five verses, notice how they give us the most insight into the role of Christendom, of what, how, what Christendom will play in Jacob's trouble. For the violence done to your brother Jacob, that's Israel, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. Now notice why. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But you should not have gloated over the day of your brother and the day of his misfortune. You should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. You should not have boasted in the day of distress. So here we see Edom, Christendom will be cast off forever. Why? Because as allies of their brother Jacob, picturing Israel, Edom or Christendom was supposed to help her, to protect her from her enemies. But what did they do instead? 
when the armies of Israel, uh, I mean, the armies of Gog come from the north and attack Israel, we're told that Edom or Christendom's army stood aloof. They were there, but they stood aloof. That is, they just stood by and did nothing, actually gloating or rejoicing over Israel being spoiled by the forces of God. Just as we noted earlier in Ezekiel, they handed over the Israelites to the sword. Psalm 137.7 also tells us of Christendom's rooting or rejoicing over Gog's forces in tearing down Jerusalem. Remember, O Lord, what the Edomites, Christendom, did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, tear it down, they cried, down to its foundations. They were literally, they will literally root for the forces of Gog, Gog from the north, to tear down Jerusalem. Coming back to Obadiah, where we saw Christendom standing aloof, doing nothing, rejoicing over the strangers from the north coming to attack, we now want to go on to verses 13 and 14 that describe what the forces, of, after the forces of God leave Jerusalem, Christendom's army, then they go against Jerusalem to plunder whatever else still remains that Gog's forces from the north didn't plunder. Verse 13. You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of his calamity. You should not have gloated over his disaster in the day of his calamity. You should not have looted his goods in the day of his calamity. You should not have stood at the parting of the ways to cut off his fugitives. You should not have delivered up the survivors in the day of distress. So after the forces of God have done their plundering and left Jerusalem, Christendom's army will enter the city to plunder what still remains. And then they'll lay in wait to capture the Israeli fugitives as they escape from the city. Thus these verses in Obadiah indicate that even though Christendom presently claims to be the ally of Israel, anti-Semitism will gradually grow to the point where Christendom will be guilty of actually gloating, rejoicing over Israel getting spoiled by her enemies from the north. And when Gog leaves with their spoil, Christendom's armies will follow after with their own spoiling of what yet remains in Israel at the end of Jacob's trouble. Anti-Semitism will have reached its climax when God speaks to Israel in Jeremiah 30, 14, all your lovers have forgotten you. They do not seek you. For I have wounded you, that is Israel, with the wound of an enemy, with the punishment of a cruel one, because your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous. The next two verses of Obadiah give us God's response of what will follow. For near is the day of Jehovah upon all nations. Just as thou hast done, shall it be done to thee. Thy dealing shall come back upon thine own head. For as you have drunk, that is spoiled, on the holy mountains, all the nations shall drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. Well, verse 15 kind of seems to be out of context here because the, the previous verses of Obadiah is talking about the judgment against Edom and about how the armies from the north will come attack and Edom just stands by when doing nothing. And then it says this a pronouncement of the day of Jehovah, which is going to be upon all the nations, just as they had done, so it will be done to them. But then in 16, it goes back to specifically mention those who had drunk or spoiled on the mountains of Israel. <clears throat> well, since Obadiah is all about the judgment 
of Edom to come. We could see that it would certainly include all the nations of Christendom, as well as the forces of Gog that come from the north against Israel. They're all going to take spoils from the literal mountains of Israel and Jacob's trouble. But why in this context about the judgment of Christendom is the recompense of the day of the Lord upon all the nations brought up? We have two other scriptures that kind of tie in and can help give us an understanding <clears throat> that these scriptures also seem to refer to the fact that all nations will be involved with Israel somehow in Jacob's trouble. Joel 3.2, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which means Jehovah has judged. There I will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel. For they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. Zechariah 14.2 I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the house is rifled, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall be cut off from the city. I don't know if you've ever wondered, but, but I've often wondered how all the nations of the world will come against tiny little Israel in Israel's final battle. Especially when Obadiah only refers to the Christian nations and the nations of Gog that come from the north. But then I noticed in looking up the meaning of the word battle in Jacinius Hebrew lexicon, as well as looking how this word, the same word for battle is used in other scriptures, I saw that it could refer to other forms of contention than actual literal warfare in battle. It can refer to various things like we sometimes are fighting a cold, or as in the following example of fighting a war to prevent our death, Ecclesiastes 8.8, 8. no one has the power to prevent the spirit of life from leaving. No one has control over the day of his own death. There is no way to avoid the war or battle against death. And then I thought, well, could it possibly be that all nations could refer to nations not necessarily in literal battle, but they're in contention with Israel, condemning Israel for their actions in some way. Could it be that the United Nations could be representative of all the nations in these scriptures? Thought came to mind. So I began looking on the internet to try to see if, if there's a tie-in in that way. And I was thrilled with what I found. At present, there are 195 recognized independent nations in the world. And I wondered how many of these nations are members of the United Nations? We found that at present there are 193 of the 195. They're member states in the United Nations. Virtually all the nations of the world are represented in the new UN except two. Vatican City, with its pope and 770 other people, they declined to be part of UN membership, and Taiwan, who was included in China. And then I wondered if it was possible to find a list of resolutions passed by the United Nations concerning Israel. We did a search in Google, and lo and behold, this is what I found. In a 22, I know you can't read that. <laughs> in a 22-year span, the UN Security Council has adopted 131 resolutions directly addressing the Arab-Israeli conflict. And in, on the internet and in Encyclopedia Wikipedia, it states, the UN Human Rights Council has adopted more resolutions condemning Israel than it has for all other states combined. And I thought, 
Perhaps that is the answer. I think we can see that the scriptures that refer to all nations coming against Jerusalem could be fulfilled, but not necessarily by literal battle. <clears throat> the nations of Christendom and those of Gog will have literal battles on the mountains of Jerusalem. But God may consider all the rest of the nations as having a part because of their representation of condemning Israel in the UN. Though many condemnations of Israel have already taken place in the UN, I think it's merely the beginning. What will come to an overwhelming climax just before or at the time of Jacob's trouble. But in addition, for all the evil that these other nations have done throughout the ages, God brings into Obadiah, there will be a recompense upon all of them in this day of Jehovah. It will result, it result in the removal of all the nations. As Obadiah says, it will be as though they had not been. After the trouble ends, we're told in verse 17, but in Mount Zion shall be a delivered remnant which shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions or inheritance. So Jacob's trouble ends with a holy remnant of Israel coming through the trouble, and then Israel will go on to receive the blessings of their inheritance in the kingdom. The phrase in Mount Zion shall be a delivered remnant which shall be holy is the same thought conveyed in Isaiah 4.3. It will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem, that is remaining after Jacob's trouble, all who remain will be called holy, everyone which is recorded for life in Jerusalem. The next verse, 18, describes who God will use to bring about the final punishment upon Christendom. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame, but the house of Esau will be a stubble, and they will set them on fire and consume them, so there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Here the house of Jacob would represent natural Israel, and the house of Joseph would represent spiritual Israel, Jesus and the church. Because you recall Joseph in many ways was typified our Lord. So what we see is together, spiritual and natural Israel will be as a fire and flame as they burn and consume the house of Esau or Christendom. When it says, so there will be no survivors left, it doesn't mean they will all be killed, no, no. But rather they will be burned as tares, imitation wheat, ceasing to recognize themselves any longer as being Christ's kingdom. Note two other scriptures which indicate even more directly that natural Israel will have a role in carrying out the judgment against Christendom. Ezekiel 25, 12-14. Because Edom acted revengefully against the house of Judah and has grievously offended in taking vengeance upon them, therefore thus says the Lord God, I will lay my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel. And they shall do in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath, and they shall know my vengeance, says the Lord God. Of course, this will be how God will in turn be fighting with Israel at this time. Zechariah 12.6 pinpoints who it will be in Israel that will direct the judgment. In that day, I will make the governors, that is the ancient wordies of Judah, like a hearth of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheaf. And they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem 
shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. So the ancient worthies will be the leaders, so to speak, in this final climactic phase. Coming back to Obadiah, verses 19 and 20, outlines the land that Israel will inherit after Jacob's trouble. Then my people who live in the Negev shall occupy the hill country of Edom. Those living in Judean lowlands shall possess the Philistine plains and repossess the fields of Ephraim and Samaria. And the people of Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The Israeli exiles shall return and occupy the Phoenician coastal strip as far north as Zarephath. Those exiled in Asia Minor shall return to their homeland. Yes, Israel will then possess all the land that was promised to Father Abraham, from the river of Egypt, which is the Wadi El Irish, to the great river Euphrates. The prophecy of Obadiah ends with describing the kingdom in verse 21. And saviors, Jesus and the church, shall come up on Mount Zion to rule all Edom, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. A wonderful ending to the judgment of Edom. Though Christendom will be consumed as tares, they are going to be blessed. They're going to be blessed by saviors, Jesus and the church, in the kingdom that will be Jehovah's.